Happy Halloween, everybody! Welcome to Get Ready With Me and Talk About Stuff, the show where I get ready and talk with you about whatever happens to be on my mind. Um, today is the last video I'm going to be doing for a while. I said that I would do videos through spooky season per the request of a few people, and I have now done that. So, um, I didn't have any intentions to carry this forward, but... If people suggest some interesting topics, I might be willing to reconsider that and um, do more videos. So if you'd like to do that, just uh, leave a message in the comments or, you know, if you follow me on Twitter or whatever, you can tell me there that, hey, I think this would be a great topic. Can you do it? And I very well might do that. Um, today's topic is a very... It's an interesting one. It, it was one that um, I don't even remember how I got to looking up, you know, diving into this rabbit hole because it was not a viewer suggestion. It was um, just something that one way or another I happened to find on the Google. And it was interesting enough to me that I decided to go for it. And, you know, after I started looking into it, I realized that this is actually... Um, the subject of today's video is actually something that several paranormal investigators have looked into and somehow or other I just missed it so which is weird because I watch so much stuff regarding the paranormal but I missed this one somehow anyway before I get into that um, I did leave all the sources that I used for today's video in the description as always so if um, this topic intrigues you you can always look there to learn more about it and I will also leave in the video um, link tell you how you can follow me on Instagram or on Twitter and the reason I'm in opening those up is because if you want to support this vid this little thing I've got going on you can do that by purchasing my art. I do have an, Ep an Etsy shop, but it's acting kind of wonky lately, so I'm not really directing people to it because I can't get it to work properly. Um, they started using a new bank verification system and it's telling me all my information is wrong and quite frankly, I don't have time to sit on the phone or, or sit in a chat with a customer service person to get this straightened out. I've got better things to do and other ways to sell my art. So thanks Etsy for making everything just a little bit harder right before the holidays. That was great. Um, now that I've got that out of my system. <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about the Crescent Hotel. And as I said, you know, this was a topic that, despite my enthusiasm for the paranormal, I somehow completely and utterly missed this, <laughs> which is weird. But here we are now, so let's have a little bit of fun as we dive deep into this subject and into the uh, person who kind of probably made it what it is today uh, for better or worse. So the, um, the Crescent Hotel was designed in 1885 by an architect named Isaac Taylor. And Isaac Taylor is probably best known for, I believe he made a structure of some kind or other for the uh, World's, World's Fair, no, State Fair, I believe. <clears throat> Anyway, he's known for more than the Crescent Hotel, is my point. Um, but he made, he designed this hotel in 1885, and the intention of the hotel was to make it like a luxury resort, like a, a place where the rich and famous could go and play and, you know, just bask in their amazing wealth and fame and not be bothered by the peasantry. <laughs> I guess you could say. So the hotel was designed in 1885. It opened in 1886, and the intention was to have it um, operating year-round as a very elite destination. But from the beginning, the Crescent Hotel was, um, I guess you could call it a money pit. The, the hotel um, just could not make a profit. It was so expensive to operate. It was you know, very expensive to keep it in good, um, you know, everything in good working order. And I believe it was by 1887, the hotel, the, the resort was closed. It just, 
it could not, it buckled under the weight of its own grandeur, I, I think is probably the easiest way to say it. Now, it was referred to as the Grand Old Lady of the Ozarks, though, and it opened to much fanfare, but from the beginning, it had problems. Um, there have been many people who have passed away at the hotel, and the first alleged victim of the hotel's, um, you know, I don't know, thirst for blood or something, I guess, I don't know. But uh, It was a man, supposedly a man named Michael, and he was a stone worker, and he fell to his death during the construction of the Crescent Hotel. Now that is, as far as I know, that is just like lore that is part of the hotel's uh, mystique. I don't know that that has ever been confirmed. Um, after the Crescent Hotel closed its doors as a, as a year-round resort for the rich and famous, it fell into disrepair. But in 1901, the owners of the hotel rented it out to um, a girls' school. So during the school year, it was, you know, the, the girls were there and it operated as a school. And then in the summertime, it would operate again as a resort. But once again, it just proved to be too expensive. And by 1908, the, the hotel had become too run down. Um, for the tourists, nobody was stopping in there. They were like, boy, this place is a dump. I've heard so much about it, but man, look at this place. And people just stopped showing up. So it, it continued to operate as a girls' school, but then in the summertime, it would be closed. The resort portion of the offerings of the Crescent Hotel were no more. I mean, again. So another tragedy um, that befell the hotel, supposedly, local legend has it, that a young woman either fell or leapt to her death from the hotel balcony. And it is believed that she was pregnant and she um, died by suicide as a result of being ashamed of her pregnancy, you know. And back in the day, um, a girl pregnant outside of wedlock would have been you know, I think there's still in some, in some degree, certainly not as much as it used to be, but in some degree there, there is still some shame, some stigma attached to, uh, certainly to single motherhood, but, um, to someone being pregnant outside of wedlock. But back then, if you were pregnant and you were not married, it could, it could ruin your life. It could literally destroy your life. So this girl was just so ashamed and she knew that, you know, going forward, it was about to get tough. It was not going to be an easy road. And, you know, maybe it also had something to do with who fathered the baby. I don't know. But anyway, this girl decided, allegedly, that it would be in her best interest for her life to end. And tragically, supposedly, she leapt from the balcony and died. Now, the Crescent Hotel, though, continues to be a problem. And in 1924, the girls' school closed and a junior college opened. And that ran for four years, after which time, once again, the hotel did its thing and had a bunch of money dumped into it, only to prove itself to be too difficult to, to uh, keep open, too costly. And the hotel was, the junior college closed, the hotel was left abandoned, and it just stood empty for several years. And then, 1937, someone would come into that hotel that would change its, its fate forever. And who is this person? This person who came to the hotel in 1937, as the hotel was buckling under the weight of its own grandiosity and the weight of the Great Depression, a man named Norman Baker came into that hotel and changed a lot of people's lives forever and ever and ever. So who was Norman Baker? Now he is, he is, he is something. Let me tell you, he is, he's a real treat. We'll start with that. So he was the youngest of 10 children, um, and he was born to John and Francis Baker. 
youngest, uh, the, he was the last baby. And they lived in Muscatine, Iowa. And by the way, if I'm mispronouncing that, I'm sorry. I'm doing my best here. Um, they lived in Muscatine, Iowa. And jo his father, John, was an engineer and an inventor. He uh, supposedly, or not supposedly, he did. There's no allegedly there because these are records you can look up. He held 126 patents. And he also owned and operated the Baker's or Baker Manufacturing Company in Muscatine, Iowa. And his mother, Frances, was a very well-established writer prior to her marriage to, um, to John, at which point, I'm guessing that trying to continue a writing career while you're raising 10 children probably does not come easily to anybody. And she focused on motherhood. So Norman Baker, you know, grew up in an environment that, you know, creativity was uh, rewarded. Um, he grew up in an environment that encouraged him to, you know, uh, use his creativity to expand his own horizons, you know, to decide to basically set his own fate. That was the, or, or blaze his own trail. That was the impression I got as I looked into this guy. Um, he was given support to, you know, just venture into these paths in life that were not going to be typical, but they would be rewarding. So Norman Baker, choosing a, path, a road less traveled by, and <laughs> dropped out of school in the 10th grade and followed in his father's footsteps to become a machinist. So I guess at that point, Maybe he wasn't looking for the road that's traveled by so much as he was just tired of being in school and he just dropped out in 10th grade and decided that he was just going to try something different. Now, he did this for a while, but Norman Baker was not the kind of person who was going to be satisfied just, you know, following in the trail that his father blazed for him and be a machinist, settle down, have just a quiet life. That was not Norman Baker at all. And he would eventually witness a show that would change his life forever. It would completely change the course that his life was taking. And this show was uh, what at the time they would call a mentalist, which I believe would be like a, like a, mind reading kind of act or like a, a fortune telling kind of act and he saw this happening and he decided that he enjoyed the showmanship and the entertainment of it so much and certainly the money making possibilities so much that he left his job as a machinist and he actually formed his own vaudeville troupe and they traveled and that became his career. For the next 10 years, he and this troupe that he had formed would, um, would travel. And they starred, the show starred a mind reader known as Madame Pearl Tangley, or Tangley. And that was his life. Now, he reportedly married someone, one of the actresses in the troupe. But the marriage was annulled. And... The troop traveled for, as I said, 10 years before Baker decided that he would return to Muscatine and, you know, start something new. He was basically getting bored is what I gathered, which again, he was encouraged to be creative and adventurous. So I would imagine that, yeah, doing that same thing for 10 years with, you know, only limited possibilities as far as how big his show could become, that would get boring to someone who has a very active and imaginative mind like he did. Um, and that is the nicest way to say what I can, what needs to be said about, you know, where his path goes from here. So in 1926, the, um, the, I guess the invention of the radio, uh, Oh, I should say, okay, so let me back up a little bit before this happened. So he moved to Muscatine. He did remarry, I, I gathered. And he actually made a very comfortable living for himself using that creativity that I mentioned. He invented his own 
his own few things, one of them being the calliophone. I think it's also known as the calliope. I think those are the same thing. And basically it's like a, like a miniature pipe organ on wheels. And you can wheel it around, you can make noise, or I'm sorry, make music rather. You can make music and earn yourself a little bit of money doing that. Um, people love this calliophone so much that within one year's time, he patented, he patented the design and he sold so many of them that he made about $300,000 in one year's time just on that alone. And he also had other businesses. He had a mail order business and he had a correspondence art school. So he was, he was making really good money. Now in 1924 though, he is again, you know, like, oh, I just want to do something new. I hear this whole radio thing is really taking off. I want to do that. And this would be a pivotal decision in his life. And even though people didn't know it yet, the lives of many, many other people. So he decided he would, you know, he was a showman. He knew how to use his, um, you know, how to, how to talk to people in a very persuasive way. And the, what he decided to do was he went to the Muscatine Chamber of Commerce and he basically said, listen, if you allow me to open a radio station and you don't charge me any of the, you know, pesky fees and utilities and all that that are associated with the radio station, I am going to make Muscatine famous. And the Chamber of Commerce was like, you know, it would be really nice if Muscatine was famous. I mean, we'd probably get so much money coming in. And they were like, sure, do that. I, I think that you're gonna take care of your end of the deal and we trust you to get this done. So yes, go open a radio station and we're just going to ignore all the fees and so forth. You, you do that, put us on the map. And so what he did was he opened his, radio, he built his radio station on a mountaintop in Muscatine and he began, he, he began broadcasting. Um, he also, along with the radio station, he built, or the radio tower, I should say, he built a restaurant up on this hilltop. He built um, a gift shop. And he also built a gas station that had six pumps and they had the cheapest gas in the region. So there were people that were coming from all over the place to buy this inexpensive fuel and then finding out there is a lot more going on up there than just a gas station and it really did become a thing now the name of his station was uh it was um ktnt which was know the naked truth and from the start he was a little bit <laughs> he he was shady <laughs> I guess that's the nicest way to put it. He was a shady guy. So the vantage point offered by having his radio station on a hilltop was that he could really mess with the Federal Radio Commission and the limitations of his licensing. So he was licensed for a five, I've read two numbers, 500 watts and 5,000 watt tower. I'm not sure which is the correct one. But he was, anyway, he was licensed for a signal that had a limited reach. But because he was up on a hilltop and he could kind of see things coming before they got there, he would boost his signal up to 10,000 watts, which allowed him to reach a lot more people. And then what would happen is either he or an employee would kind of look out and watch to see if a, if a federal radio commission agent was coming to deal with this situation. And if that happened, they would just lower the signal down. So by the time somebody got there, they, they could be like, I don't know what you're talking about. Our signal is exactly what you licensed us to be because we only operate within the limits of the law, sir. That's just the kind of guy he was. Now, boosting his signal though, allowed him to have a much greater reach than his licensing would have allowed for. And he, his show quickly became one of the most popular radio shows in the country. And thousands of people 
would flock to Muscatine specifically to go to the tower or the hilltop where the KTNT tower was and where um, Norman Baker's show was being re recorded and they would just go make a day of it. They would go to the restaurant, they would, um, you know, spend time maybe in the gift shop and they could picnic out there and, you know, they could put gas in the car for the trip home when everything was said and done. And it was just, you know, he, whatever one person, whatever we might say about Norman Baker, he was very good at making money. And on an average Sunday afternoon, his little radio station with all its little uh, gift shop and everything, it could bring in about $3,000 on a Sunday afternoon, which in today's money is about $48,000, which is not a bad haul for a little radio station out in Iowa sitting on a hilltop all by its lonely little self. So he knew what he was doing. He was a very persuasive person. All those years spent in vaudeville had taught him um, how to work a crowd, basically. And he was very, very good at what he did. Now, he was very influential. He not only had, you know, obviously he had the most popular radio show, but you know, he, his influence was such that um, he had been invited to, um, or he had been influential in the 1928 presidential election, essentially winning the Midwest for Herbert Hoover during that election. And he, you know, as a show of gratitude, he had been invited to the White House where he met Herbert Hoover. And Herbert Hoover would actually, later on, participate in a publicity stunt to help launch Norman Baker's newspaper called the Midwest Free Press paper. And the whole thing was Herbert Hoover in, you know, it was a photo op and, and he would push this. He was in Washington, D.C. He didn't come out to Iowa to do this, but in Washington, D.C., he pushed a button that supposedly started the printing press and that was going to churn out the newspaper. But why did he, why, what was it about Norman Baker that made him so popular? It had to be more than just that he knew how to talk to people, right? Well, right you are. So Norman Baker, in his skills to know how to work a crowd, he knew how to, he knew the best ways to reach them and knew exactly what to say, exactly what to do. And one of the things he did that maybe was different from what other radio shows were doing at the time is he would make sure to broadcast um, in the evening when families were home, you know, people had come home from their, their work day and were just relaxing, listening to the radio. That was the thing to do back then. And he you, he really capitalized on the fact that people would be relaxing in their homes and just listening to whatever cool thing they could find on the radio. And that really did a lot to, <clears throat> to boost his, um, you know, his crowd appeal. But more than that, I think, unfortunately, is the fact that he also knew how to play on people's fears. He himself was a very paranoid man and has said that he um, had bulletproof glass installed on his office at the radio station and that he would keep, um, you know, submachine guns within reach. I believe he had two within reach at all times. He was a very paranoid man and he connected with other very paranoid people very well. Um, he was an avid conspiracy theorist and if anybody spoke out against him and said, you know, what he's saying isn't true. This guy is, you know, really making, uh, he's making a living off of lying to all of you. If anybody were to say something like that, he would say that, you know, that was part of the conspiracy, that the, there was a conspiracy to silence him and to, um, in his words, shut down the truth and that is how he would handle any criticism that was aimed at what he was telling his audience. And that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? So it's, it's like this circular thinking. I believe it's called cascading, um, 
a cascading mentality is if you believe <clears throat> in this situation, if you believe there is indeed a conspiracy theory against, in this case, Norman Baker, then it stands to reason that any, uh, any criticisms of Norman Baker are also part of the conspiracy. So he really worked the crowd with that circular logic. There was just really nothing anybody can say that was going to dissuade his fans from believing that he was like the smartest guy on the planet and anybody who said otherwise just was trying to, to hide the truth about, you know, vaccines and stuff. Oh, vaccines. Yes, Norman Baker uh, did not believe that vaccines were necessary. He openly stated that he believed vaccines and other uh, medical interventions or treatments were just products of a greedy uh, American Medical Association who was willing to charge people just obscene amounts of money to line their pockets uh, by giving them treatments that they didn't need. That was just kind of what he did. And you know, it's really interesting that as much as things change, they stay the same because as I was researching this, I thought, wow, things just keep coming back around, don't they? So one of the, the fallouts of this is something that is called the Cow Wars. The Cow Wars happened, um, let's see, did, there was a, tubercu a bovine tuberculosis outbreak and Norman Baker's audience, though, believed him when he said that, you know, this outbreak is just, you know, it's cooked up. It's a cooked up event that's not really happening. And the quest to, you know, the, the option that, that farmers had was either vaccinate your cows or we're going to, um, you know, if we come out and test and they're, and they're positive for TB, you know, obviously your cows are going to be confiscated. So your best bet is to vaccinate your cows. Well, he was telling his listeners that the uh, vaccination itself was unnecessary. And the only reason that these veterinarians that worked for like the USDA, whatever it would have been called back then, I think it was still the USDA. Anyway, that they were coming out to farms and testing cows and saying that these cows had bovine tuberculosis just because they wanted to uh, confiscate healthy cows for their own benefit. What ended up happening was farmers just were not allowing anyone to come onto their property and test their cows. They were refusing to vaccinate and then refusing to allow their cows to be tested. So they would run these veterinarians off their property um, you know, with threats of violence. Some of these veterinarians ended up having to leave the region entirely because Norman Baker's, um, you know, his audience was so vicious about the, you know, what they took as fact that, you know, these veterinarians just wanted their cows for their own benefit and there was really nothing wrong with these cows. You know, these veterinarians ended up having to leave. And this, this cow war carried on until the governor of Iowa actually sent in the National Guard and put a stop to it. So, you know, Norman Baker, you know, but he didn't care. He was a really wealthy guy. And he's like, I don't, he didn't really care what happened to his listeners or how his bad advice could affect their lives. He just carried on with what he was doing as if everything was exactly as it should be. Now, Norman Baker, though, he was getting frustrated with the limited reach that he had on his radio program. He had, he had the most well-loved radio show in the state in the United States. He, um, you know, anything that anybody said against him, he knew that he could count on his listeners to believe him when he said, Oh, they're just jealous or whatever, but that wasn't enough for him. And he would end up, uh, connecting with another person who also had a belief in like this, uh, quackery, if you will, that, you know, uh, vaccines are not necessary, medical treatments are not necessary, they're just a way to fleece the public, and um, this person that he met up, or that he crossed paths with, also went so far as to say that 
they had a, found a cure for cancer and they had created this elixir that was basically guaranteed to cure cancer. And Norman Baker at that point also had his own little quote, cancer cure. And these two men decided that they were going to, um, you know, go into business together. So this doctor that he had connected with, he, um, he did have already his own cancer curing clinic, I guess you could say. And what they decided to do was to select five patients from that doctor's clinic and give them this quote elixir, this cure and see how they progress, see, see what happened basically. And to no one's surprise, every single one of these people died, but Norman Baker and this other doctor, I believe it was Dr. Orris, um, they, they, they were not going to own that. And they said, nope, every single one of them did, they, they were cured. They did better. And wouldn't you know it, we found a cure for cancer and the doctors aren't going to tell you about it because they don't make enough money curing people. They make more money treating people. And while that is true, even today, that does not mean that what these two men uh, did, did anything to even treat cancer, let alone cure it. We're at that point where I'm going to pause and finish all this, and then I will come back and we're going <laughs> to, we have a long way to go. This is a very uh, interesting and somewhat infuriating story, so I hope you'll stick with me to the end because it is about to get crazy. So buckle up. I will be right back. Okay, I am back. This, <laughs> so I'm rainbow bright or that's what I was trying to be, but those wig they sent me is really, really stupid. So I don't know. I might have to do something about this rainbow bright hair. Look at that. I mean, that is dumb. Like, I've worn a lot of really bad wigs. <laughs> I mean, I will really admit that. But this one is stupid. It, like, doesn't... Anyway. I'm still going to have fun with the costume. I'll just have to maybe wear um, another really bad wig that is less bad than this one. So in 1929, Baker and his friend opened the Baker Institute at Muscatine. And he claimed to have cures, you know, they claimed to have cures for cancer, cures for basically anything that is ailing you, the Baker Institute could fix it. Now what he would do was he would charge people um, $10 for an exam. Now keep in mind that most of the people who listened to this man, they were poor. They were, you know, they, they were barely getting by. So $10 for an exam was a lot of money. And then what he would do now, he was not a doctor himself, but he did staff the Baker Institute with these minimally qualified doctors. I mean, they were doctors. They just, most of them came out of diploma mills basically. And then there were also, there was a chiropractor or two on staff. And there was also, uh, I believe, a, um, like an osteopath, but so he would give it, you know, tell them, excuse me, that, you know, they, they were the ones that would have to do the exams and make the diagnosis and so forth. And oddly enough, every single person that came through those doors for an exam was told that they had the worst case that doctor had ever seen of whatever it was that was ailing them. And of course the cure was to do an inpatient treatment uh, it, by taking these elixirs. And it didn't matter what you were sick with, you were given the, these, one of the two elixirs, either um, Norman Baker's elixir or this doctor, the other doctor, I don't remember his name. Um, that's what the treatment was. You would just get injected with this multiple times a day. And it didn't matter what you were sick with. Now, Norman Baker heavily promoted his, uh, his newly found quote hospital on his radio station. And that was how people would, you know, they'd hear about this miraculous place where you could get cured of whatever it was that was ailing you. Like they could probably even cure this wig if they wanted to. Um, and so people were flocking to this Institute, believing that Norman Baker, he was it, man. If you were sick, he was going to make you well. And that was actually the phrase they used where sick folks come to get well or something along those lines. Now, the American Medical Association had been 
you know, speaking out against about, I'm sorry, speaking out against Norman Baker for quite some time because his quackery far preceded his um, opening of this, for lack of a better term, hospital. And they spoke, very, spoke out very strongly against him because keep in mind, this man had no medical training whatsoever. And he's telling people that he, he just happened upon this uh, elixir that he put together that could cure cancer, could cure anything. So the AMA spoke, about, spoke out against him, uh, very blatantly called him a quack, um, you know, saying he didn't know what he was talking about. He was misleading people. He was harming people. And they also asked the Federal Radio Commission to uh, pull Baker's radio license. And the commission complied. So in 1931, the KTNT radio closed its doors. Now in 1932, however, you know, Norman Baker obviously was not going to um, let go of this big moneymaker that he had without a fight. So he sued the American Medical Association and he made blatantly anti-Semitic comments about Dr. Fishstein, who was the director of the AMA at the time. And... Uh, and, you know, he, and another thing he did is after he sued them, he would send out uh, a plea to those who received his newsletter or, or newspaper, you know, help me raise $500,000 to fight the AMA. They are trying to shut down the truth. Again, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? So in 1932, he sues the American Medical Association, and that was a mistake because what ended up happening was the ingredients of his quote elixir were brought was brought to light and it consisted of uh, like corn flour crushed melon seeds um water uh corn silk you know nothing in it that would have actually cured cancer or probably anything else and that was brought out that was brought to light and it was quite the downfall. So, you know, his radio station is no more, which means he's not getting people coming to his hospital. Um, you know, he had to do something. So he decided that going to Mexico was the solution to all of his problems. So he went to Mexico and he, he started what was called a border buster radio station. Uh, X E N T, and the reason it was called a border buster is because it was such a powerful signal that was being sent out that it was going to reach far more people than what he had been able to reach with his radio station in Iowa. And for that reason, people continued. Um, you know, the numbers started picking up again with people going to his uh, his supposed hospital and so forth. Um, at one point he even went back to Iowa. Uh, he, he ran actually from a distance. He ran for governor of Iowa, uh, while he was still in Mexico and he lost that. And, you know, he did that for a while, but he, uh, decided he was going to go back to Iowa and not only kind of try to pick up where he left off with his, his hospital, but he was also going to run for a seat in the U S Senate, which of course he lost that election. And by this time, his relationship, or his relationship, his reputation was in tatters. It was, it was time for him to um, maybe look for greener pastures somewhere. So, he went to Eure he went he went to Eureka Springs, and he found out about the Crescent Hotel. Now again, the Crescent Hotel, as I mentioned earlier, it it had been through many many owners. It had gone through some stuff. I mean, it really hadn't even been around that long. So this was, it was built in 1886. We're now looking in it, like 1937. So it hasn't been around that long. And in that short amount of time, it's had multiple owners. It has seen all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, it's been in disrepair. It's been abandoned. So Baker came in and he basically saved the owners of the Crescent Hotel from financial ruin by offering them a sum that would in today's money be, I believe it was around $700,000. And then he put $50,000 into renovations to make another quote hospital. 
And I keep putting it in quotes because, I mean, he's not a doctor. He's not a medical professional of any kind. He just has a, a basically snake oil he wants to sell. And he opened the hospital and he moved his entire staff and 100 of his patients, you know, all 100 patients, I should say, from Iowa to Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And he had a brand new start. He started putting out literature, promoting the hospital, claiming that he had cures for everything from constipation to cancer. Again, it didn't matter what you had. He had the cure for it. And the cure for it was always, regardless of your diagnosis, uh, multiple injections a day of those elixirs. I really want you to keep in mind, he had no medical training. None. None. So as time goes on, He's giving these, you know, he's, well, he's telling his doctors to administer these elixirs to these patients under the pretense that it's going to actually help them. And what ended up happening, so these, first of all, these people would come in for help and he would end up charging them a fee for their treatments that would financially wipe them out. I mean, these were farmers, you know, these, these were not wealthy people. And an average treatment there could cost anywhere from $1,000 to $8,000 for an average stay. Um, but that did not deter Baker whatsoever. He truly did not care. I guess I kind of think the impression I'm getting is that he felt like, well, if you're dumb enough to believe me and you're dumb enough to think that this elixir, which you know the ingredients of now thanks to the lawsuit, um, if you're dumb enough to fall for it, that's on you. I am not going to feel bad about taking your money. He knew that his stuff did not work. So what he did is he had one wing of his hospital soundproofed and called it a psychiatric ward. And there was very limited access to this part of his hospital. And what that actually was, was where people would go after their cancer had progressed to such a degree that they were in constant pain and they were dying. They were very actively dying, being consumed by their cancer, but he could still make money off of them. So he wasn't going to just send these people home and they would be sent to the soundproofed wing of the hospital, basically to moan and scream and cry out in pain until they died. Now, some people though, he would declare them cured and then send them home. And that some of these people would either die en route to, to their hometown or they would die shortly after arriving. I'm guessing that those were people who had no money left to give him. So he didn't feel the need to keep them in his soundproofed wing of the hospital until they died. He was just like, let's send you home and free up a bed so I can uh, get someone else in here to take these elixirs that aren't going to do a thing for them. So despite these heinous, harmful, terrible practices, Norman Baker seemed unstoppable. He was a wealthy man. He had resources to keep this going for quite some time. It was not until 1940 that he was finally facing charges for, nope, not murder, mail fraud. Because he had been mailing out uh, pleas for, for money to help him, um, you know, fight the people who were trying to shut down the truth. And he was making promises he couldn't keep. The U.S. Postal Service inspector, they, the inspectors finally had enough. And he was uh, brought, brought up on charges of mail fraud. And he did actually serve a, a, a sentence in Leavenworth, federal penitentiary. You're thinking, maybe you're thinking, finally, some justice for these people he's been fleecing and, if we're being blunt about it, killing for the last several years. Do you know what his sentence was? It was a whopping three years in the federal penitentiary. Now, upon his release, he attempted to open another facility in Muscatine, but by that time, people were like, no, you're not opening a facility here. And he ended up retiring on a, a three-story yacht in Florida. And he died there of liver cirrhosis of the liver in 1958 at the age of 75.
five. So while Baker never claimed to be a doctor, he definitely used his showmanship to fleece people for money and to, even when people tried to hold him accountable, he would use that, all those skills he'd learned as a vaudeville performer to just keep the ruse going as long as possible. He also was very blatantly anti-Semitic, very blatantly anti-Catholic. He was anti-science. He didn't. He he was anti-education. Really tapping into uh, the the fears and the biases people had and running with it, and it made him a wealthy man. Now, in the time that the Baker Institute was opened in Eureka Springs. Uh, 44 people would lose their lives and no autopsies from what I read no autopsies were actually performed because the belief was well these people came here with cancer and they died of course so there's no reason to autopsy them they, they died of cancer case closed and the reason that matters is because I have read some reports saying that his elixir also had carbolic acid in it which was extremely poisonous and it attacked the organs and over time if you kept taking it it would absolutely kill you but with no autopsies being performed if that is what was killing people nobody would know um baker's notoriety continues in 2019 a groundskeeper uh ugh, brought in by the current owners they actually found a cache of glass bottles hundreds of them, and it was determined that these bottles were bottles that were used in the Baker Hospital, and some of them still had tissue samples in them. Um, Mr. Mr. Baker would keep these bottles around as evidence that, look at this tumor, you know, we, uh, we cured this person, and which begs the question of how did you get the tumor if the person was cured, like wouldn't they have to be dead for you to cut that out of them, but I digress. What do I know? Um, and it, it, you know, apparently he would keep these things around the hospital and just to try to impress people to make it look like he knew what he was talking about. So, you know, the Baker or the, the Crescent Hotel, a lot of the activity that happens there is said to be related to the occurrences, um, to what happened while the Baker hospital was opened. Um, there is, there has been a suggestion from two certified mediums that were brought in that there is actually a portal through which things travel and, uh, those who are stuck on this side of, you know, eternity or whatever you want to call it, they, they kind of hang, they come through this portal and it, it, this portal is in a room right above what served as the morgue during the days of the Baker hospital. So you know, the Crescent Hotel has certainly seen its share of uh, intrigue and tragedies and so forth over the year. Maybe not nearly as tragic as this wig, but certainly terrible things. And is something there? I don't know. Maybe. I think it's hard to prove definitively that paranormal activity is happening anywhere. Um, but at the very least, I would imagine that because of what did happen there during the days of the Baker Hospital and you know, how these people just suffered so horribly, I would imagine at the very least that there is an energy there that just does not feel right. And whether that rises to the level of being paranormal or not, I can't say. I've never been there and uh, I have never obviously had an experience. And I think you can learn some things by watching, you know, TV shows about it and so forth. But, you know, who can say? Who knows? Anyway, so that's all I have for today. That's all I have for now altogether. Um, thanks for those of you who suggested topics. I hope that these few videos have been fun for you. And maybe I'll come back with more if y'all suggest some interesting things. But until then, be good to yourself. Be good to each other. Don't shoot on yourself or anyone else. And have a happy, happy Halloween. And, and you know, if you're going to wear a wig, maybe, maybe don't get one like this. That's all I'm saying. All right, I will see you all again uh, whenever I see you, I guess. Bye.